All right, hi guys, Richard Jackson here, Lepers Trading. I've got Ryan Grogan here, who's a trader. Been a trader with me for a couple of years, I guess. How long's it been, Ryan? What do you reckon? Uh, four years. Four years, wow, okay. So Ryan's got allocated now. He's up to 250,000, looking for 500 grand. Um, and we're just gonna have a general chat just to see, you know, just so that you don't hear me all the time and we can uh, see what other traders think and feel and how they deal with uh, their different hurdles that they've gone through in their journey. And uh, we'll just have a quick chat. So Ryan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Okay, no problem. So you started off as a soccer coach. Yeah, so I've been a soccer coach, football coach um, since I was 21 years old. I'm 34 now. Um, um, essentially, my journey started um, as a player. I mean, uh, the old cliche, I've, I've had three ACL uh, reconstructions and I've had a complete knee reconstruction um, wow. as well, which made me retire. I had to retire from the game at 20. So I basically made the decision uh, when I was younger that if I can't play professionally, I want to coach professionally. So I was originally brought up in Sydney, uh, but in 2009, I moved to Canberra to pursue studies at the University of Canberra. Um, in sport and coaching science and sport and sports management. And I went on to do a master in high performance sport as well. So I was at uni for a good six years. Um, and during that time, I uh, got involved in coaching professionally. I worked with the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, I moved into the high performance program with Capital Football, which is a governing body in the ACT, and basically built my, my career from there. So for the last 12 years, um, that's been my bread and butter. And, what I've been doing. Well, so what, what got you into trading? Why, why did you want to do the switch? Um, well, what was the allure? Where, sorry? What was the allure? Yeah, well, the allure was the money, obviously. I grew up in a household uh, where my parents played a lot of cards. Um, and when I was younger, um, I used to play a lot of poker. And I, I provided for myself for a number of years playing cards. Um, so I think that had something to do with the allure of trading um, because once it was exposed, I was exposed to it and I got exposed to it uh, through a friend of mine and it wasn't trading per se, a friend of mine got me exposed to the markets in 2017 um, and the initial introduction, if you imagine 2017, would have been through crypto. Um, yep. So a friend of mine had made some decent money through crypto and to be fair, on his part, for a number of years, he had tried to speak to me about what he did as a job. So he worked in that industry uh, professionally because um, when we went to uni together and he did a commerce degree, et cetera, et cetera. And to be fair, back then, I, I just didn't really want to hear about it. I wasn't all that interested in it. I thought it was quite boring. Um, but then 2017, him and I were having a conversation um, and, and things just clicked. And so he got me interested in the markets themselves. And this, was, this had nothing to do with trading. This was more from an investment point of view. Um, and then through him and, and I, I, I gave him some money and that exposed me to the markets themselves and, and that's what really hooked me and from there um, 2018 I was sort of having a look at the markets and then 2019 when I started looking at charts um, and having a look at how the markets move um, and the whole industry itself because the trading industry I've never been exposed to it was never something within my friendship group within my family um, that I knew anybody who was involved in it. So basically, apart from seeing bits and pieces in movies and, and, and TV shows, I, I didn't really know what it was. Mm. Okay. Um, but that, that was my introduction. At that time, um, I was running a football club in Sydney, um, and I think it was May in 2019, I stepped away from that role, um, and I didn't have a job for six months. And at that stage, I'd been looking at the markets for around six months, and during that time off, um, I did a lot of self-education. I bought a lot of courses online like through Investopedia, just like the basics of, of trading, what they are, the basics of technical patterns, introduction to technical analysis, all that, this, this sort of stuff. And I sort of got there. So, you know what, I've got time. I may as well educate myself because this was mid-season um, in the football world, so it wasn't really the best time to go looking for jobs. Um, so I spent that six months, five, five, six months just obsessed uh, yeah. with, with the charts and the markets themselves. That obsession is very important, isn't it? You've got to be yeah, obsessed with fun. it to be able to crack this nut, don't you? Yeah. Well, this is, and I've 
I've spoken to yourself um, previously, and I've spoken to some other people that have been trading, sort of go through this stage of obsession where I would get up, sit on my computer until I went to sleep. I was doing 16 hours in front of the charts, mm-hmm. essentially learning, watching, just gaining experience. Um, and in that period, and I, I think it's the story with a lot of people, when you first get introduced, I had a bit of early success and my ego got ahead of me. Yeah, and beginner's like, well, luck. This, this is, yeah, well, this is easier than, than some people are making out. I don't understand how um, everyone thinks this is the devil. Um, and then I got taught a really harsh lesson um, where I lost about 20K in three or four trades. Wow. You know I mean? And looking back on it now, from what I know now, I, I cringe. Yeah. You know I mean? Uh, just from a technical point of view, over leveraged, into resistance, no stop loss, all that that's, sort of that's stuff. That's typical of what everybody does is they, they come in over leveraged too quickly, don't they? Yeah, 100%. I didn't think I could lose. And I remember I went to the gym. Um, and I was watching it on my phone and then driving home from the gym when I got liquidated. And yeah. that, that feeling, it's, it's like it happened yesterday. Yeah, it's like somebody's just and, robbed you. Yeah, well, that's it. Um, it's, it's burnt into my psyche. And after that, I can look at a chart for at least a month. Yeah. I mean, I had basically a gambler's hangover. Um, I was convinced that this isn't for me, I can't do this. Um, it, it really taught me a lesson, but it, eventually, once I'd calmed down and the adrenaline had gone away and I'd got over my hangover, um, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I need to do this properly. Mm. You mean, I've, I've, I've had a, a stop check of, of myself. How long have you been doing this? What do you really know? Do you know anyone who does this? No, you don't. Um, you need to educate yourself properly. And that's when I made the decision in late 2019 that I need to find or tap into some professional traders or find someone who can point me in the right direction because I have no education in this. All of my education is self-taught or off the internet. And I know a lot of people um, can use that route and have got success with that route, uh, but I also wanted someone that I could talk to, um, someone that could guide me properly and really put a structure in in my learning process. Well, it it fast tracks it a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, 100%. And particularly coming from a background with mine where I've got absolutely no no information, no education in this subject. Um, it, yeah, to me, it just made sense. You need to get educated if you want to do this properly. So uh, it was coming up to the pre-season of the, of the next season. I was actively looking for jobs because I realized pretty goddamn quickly I can't do this full time. Um, and it was during that time as when I reached out to you and I, I reached out to a, n- a number of firms. I mean, internet search, looked around, spoke to a few people. Um, but eventually I landed on uh, coming in with you and, and, and learning your way of training. So what do you, let's let's talk about that just briefly, because I don't really want this to be about me, I want it to be more about you, but do, what's, just a quick answer on it, what's the difference between before you were with me to after? Knowledge. Knowledge, just I've deep. Got, I've, got, I've got a lot more knowledge on how the markets operate or how they work. Um, Quick answer is they're chaos, obviously, um, but there's I've, I've got structure now. So whereas a lot of the self education was around patterns, I mean double tops, double bottoms, and my understanding of those things is oh well if they show up on a chart, you take it and we we'll see what happens. They can't lose. Mm-hmm. The reality is there's a lot more nuances to that than just looking at candlestick patterns and how they form um, and understanding all of the narratives that are going on in the market potentially, all the different strategies that that are being implemented, you you can't know them all, but having a better understanding of what other people are looking at helps you in making your own educated decisions and not just essentially gambling on one shape that you're seeing in front of you. It's not just guesswork. All right, so let's let's talk about what what is your favorite strategy? What's your what's your go to? Uh, Convergence. Just the convergence. Yeah, whatever whatever you want to call it, convergence, confluence, um, a commonality point in the market. Um, I really bought into the concept that it makes more sense to have knowledge of an array of strategies and have a, a, a greater knowledge of what a lot of people are looking at in different ways and then finding points in the market where they converge or they're, they're similar areas because um, I'm of the belief um, that it increases your percentages of getting a reaction in the right way. Yeah, okay. 
And you've got some examples here that you can show us. Are we leading down the right path with that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's have a look at some of the some of what you're actually talking about here. A few trades that Ryan's taken, and let's see what um, how what, what his rationale was thinking of entry exits and managing the stop. Yeah. So with my journey, I. I went into FX and I was swing trading, uh, where I, I, I learned a lot of these concepts, uh, but I found as a day trader and on the smaller time frames, it's a lot more technical. Um, I think we're on the higher time frames, you're, I'm not very good when it comes to fundamental analysis, and I'm good, I'm better at the smaller time frames when it's a lot more technical in the noise that some people call it. But uh, essentially the things that I'm looking at, um, uh, I'll have a look at the MA, so recognizing that there are MA traders out there that trade that specifically. Uh, support resistance levels are big, because um, I know there's a lot of SR traders out there. Um, I use Fibonacci and, and the Fibonacci levels heavily in my trading, because um, Fibonacci is the basis of a number of other strategies. You know what I mean? Um, I've spent a lot of time over the last four years studying Elliott Wave theory, because um, through my own experience, I've seen Elliott Wave theory work, I understand how it can be used as a filter um, within within the market movements and market structure. Um, recently, I've, I've looked at a bit of like, smart money concepts and ICT, um, regardless of the teachings within uh, the, the, the principles and rationales behind that strategy. I understand there's a lot of people looking at it as well, so I've, I've tried to use that as one of my filters of, of convergence within my trading strategies. Um, and obviously, your, your, your harmonic patterns, you mean? So, with all of my charts might look a little bit messy at times, um, but to me it makes sense. You know, so but do you, do you, do, you, I'm... do you find that it's important to keep your charts clean as well? I mean, that's one thing that I'm pretty full on about. I think to so make sure that they stay yeah, clean, so you can keep keep looking at price. Price is the most important bit. One hundred percent. So I've. But the way that my charts are set up, this is what's most comfortable for me. I've tried different, um, say, uh, visibility, say, of my MAs or my trend lines and stuff, where I've made them softer or stronger, and sometimes I miss them. So with the picture that I've got in front of me, I can look at that, and to people who don't know what I'm looking at, that might look a little bit messy. But to me, I'm, I am looking at price, and all the other colors and stuff that are on there sort of fade away when I'm looking at when I'm looking at the chart, um, I do clean my charts most that well just about every day, particularly on the smaller time frames, because I don't want well be, between my trading sessions. So if I'm jumping off um, at night, it's a good 15 hours until I'm back on at least uh, 15, 16 hours, and in that time, price has done a lot of things. So some of my thoughts and processes from the night before aren't relevant anymore. So I clear it off, and I, I start each day by. Um, Reanalyzing, particularly on the smaller time frames, where say the SR levels are, um, I, I have a look at some of the Fibonacci levels. I redo some of my trend lines if, if they've been broken or they're no longer uh, relevant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think every, well, for me at least, every day I need, I need to clear yesterday's data off the screen um, because I need to start fresh. I can't have yesterday's bias influencing what, to, what today's bias. But if there's a if there's a major trend uh, trend line or a uh, SR level of some sort, you'll you'll have to leave that on, wouldn't you? Yeah, one hundred percent. So on my larger time frames, like my four hour, my four hour, I update that once a week. You know I mean, if if we have a look over here, like these SR levels that I've got in there. I'll oh, just hold on one second, I'm just just so I can see your cursor. Okay, go for it. Yep. Like say, so this is from six weeks ago. Like these sorts of SR levels, I don't clean them every day. Um, and if I was to expand it, because this is just a screenshot, but if I was to expand this, like these Fibonacci levels, which are what these colored lines are, yep. they're still relevant, um, obviously from one session to the next. I'm speaking more, say on the 15 minute chart or the one and five minute chart, I'll go back through, I'll have a look at the SR levels in particular from the day before, if they have held relevance through to the next day, but if they haven't, I either shorten them and keep them on my chart for future reference just in case, or I, I, if they're not relevant, I just get rid of them. So okay. they don't cloud my judgment because if an SR level is no longer an SR level on the small time frame, I don't want it on my chart. Okay. So yeah, so with this first trade, 
Um, patterns aren't particularly my strong suit. So you can have a look at this. You can say this is a head and shoulder reversal, and you can see that I've taken some fib levels that represent that. If that was just on its own, I wouldn't have taken it um, because I, I like to have more than one point of confluence at a minimum. So my thought process in a trade like this one in particular. So having a look at the higher time frames, so my thought process is back at this period of time. Um, is this could be a potential double top for me on the on the higher time frames? Um, we zoom down a little bit to the 15, and we can have a look. A lower high, so there's a break of structure potentially, but I'm also thinking in Elliott wave theory as well, um, that this could be a three wave corrective. So that's why I've got these Fibonacci levels here, because um, through my experience with, with Fibonacci levels, there's, there's certain areas that I look for in a corrective move. So I've got that in my thinking. See, I've got my trend lines in there. Um, as a reference point, although that's a two-touch trend line and may not necessarily be as important as, say, a three or four-touch one, again, it's there in my thinking. I've got Fibonacci levels on the 15, so I can have a look down here. If I'm looking at this potentially from an Elliott wave theory point of view, these are pretty decent moves. One, two, three. If this is a fourth wave, this Fibonacci into the, um, the 50 level, could be relevant, but I'm also aware of this 500 period moving average of the SM uh, on the 15 minute chart as well, acting as resistance. So recognizing that I've got a, a, a bearish bias coming down into the, the smaller time time frames, I recognize this here is a potential reversal signal, high volume weak candle, uh, but I'm also thinking that this could potentially be a three wave corrective. So again, in my head, I'm looking at this as one, two, three, or ABC. That's why I've got the one here, yep. my first point so of confluence. A, a, B equals C, D, yes. Yep. yep. There's my first point of confluence. I've also got this SR level here. So there's my second point of confluence. This is the first touch of the 200 MA um, from from the trend itself. So this is obviously after the first touch, but I've seen this develop and I've seen just through experience that sometimes the first touches don't necessarily react immediately. They might poke their head through before you get a reaction off it. And then it's gone on to form a, a small double top, which obviously in a very short time frame, saying potentially down. So with all of those things together, is why it's, uh, on top of the, this uh, bearish candle, this heavy, a bit of power in this bearish candle, is why I've, I've taken a market buy there, uh, sorry, a market sell there, and I've, I've left my stop above the double top. So there's one, two, three, four, five points of convergence in this area. You know I mean, with trades, it's not always going to be perfect because you could be saying what well, you're shorting into, potentially a retest of the 200, you've got the 50 and the 100 MA underneath you, et cetera, et cetera. But because of this, because of this, because of this, I've made the decision that I've, I've, there's a, a better percentage chance that this, this could be bearish, that at least the next few candles on, on a one minute time frame could be bearish. Um, and then I've, I've put my take profit just above this last low. Because um, as I said, I still recognize that this is a heavy resistance here. Um, and so I'm, I'm just looking for a few points out of it. You know what I mean, and that okay. ends up being a, a, a two to one trade. Very good. And do you bring your stop to break even once you know that it's heading in your direction or do you just leave it the way it is? Yes. So I, I, I've meddled around with how I move my stop a lot in the last couple of months. Initially, particularly on these really small trades, so this is a four point trade. Um, I would, if I got beyond 50% of the move itself, so if, I, if it moved two points in my direction and I've got a close of the candle two points in my direction, I'd bring it straight to break even, wherever my entry was. Um, but recently, and I'll show you some further trades, particularly in the last three or four weeks with the higher volatility, I've used more of a trailing stop. You know, so even if I get the initial reaction, um, I do look for Depending on where my target is, um, I do look for the next lower high or, lo or, or lower low to be created, and then I'll, I'll trail my stop down um, on the highs. But with, as in, in lower volatility markets, and particularly with these really small four-point trades, I tend to move it once I've got to 50% of my target, because I figure if it turns around another 50 and knocks me out at 50%, after getting 50% of the way there, well, psychologically I can handle that. It's not that big a deal. Okay, cool. Let's have a look at the next one. So this is another real small trade. This is a just a two-point trade. 
But again, we're, we're looking at um, points of convergence. So you can see this is a few weeks after the previous one. The initial thoughts of this being a double top has been proven incorrect, and we've created a higher high. So this four-hour candle here in particular, the breakout candle, because this is a long-term trend line that goes back a couple of months. Smash through that, smash through the SR. Um, so my, my bias overall is bearish based on the last five or six candles and, and, and the resistances that it had broken through. Um, the 15, similar. You mean we've got the, the heavy handle here, 4,500. You can see the, yeah. the breakout, the retest. And so uh, I'm, I'm expecting a, a bit more continuation, which reinforces my bullish bias you know, on a smaller time frame. And then when I came down to the one hour time frame, and this is an hour after the European Open, so that you can see there's not a lot of volatility. You mean one minute. Yep. You mean one minute, not one hour. Yeah, sorry. It's, yeah. it's one hour after the Open. This right. is just 6 p.m. On the one minute chart, again, I'm looking for those areas of convergence. And with this one, it's a, it's a two point, uh, sorry, a three point convergence. I don't have it drawn in there, but if you can imagine there's an SR line there. Yep. This top, this top, this top, it's been yep. smashed four times, break out from an SR level. This is a retest, plus the 50 fib, plus the first touch of the 50 MA. Again, I'm only looking for two points, and I got my reaction after a couple of years. Do, do you find that uh, as you get more and more experienced, the uh, you can just see those SR levels and those trend lines without even having to draw anything on it? Yeah, 100%. So particularly on the one hour, I'm oh, sorry, the one minute chart, the SR levels change really quickly. You know what I mean? So like this, this acts as SR, the next time it may not act as SR. So yeah. if I was to draw in every single SR that I see throughout the session, my, my chart would just be bull, a lot of bull. Yeah. I mean, so something like this, I mean, for me, that's clear. I don't need to draw that for myself because when I go back and look at my charts, I mean, I can see where the convergence is on that. Whereas this this blue line here, this would be a longer term SR that would probably extend back a couple of hours or maybe even to the previous session. Yeah. Okay. What's this one? Yep. So with this one, again, this is a, a little bit further forward than the previous one. And we can see on the four hour, the, the last trade is in here. You see that price has respected this trend line um, on the way up and we're in quite a bullish market here. However, as we come down to the shorter time frames, you can see on this is the five minute chart on this side. Having a look at some of the patterns in here, I've got a, a theory that this could potentially be a short term head and shoulders. You go even smaller again and you can uh, paint a, a different picture. So on, on the one minute chart, I've, I've painted this as a, an ending diagonal. It fits my early wave theory with, with the, the ABCDE. We've got the breakout. And again, now I've, I've looked for a convergence point, which is the retest of the breakout plus the fib level um, on top of this theory. And, and we've got the reaction in our direction. As you can see with the, the volatility of these candles, had I seen this coming, this, this has happened within 20 seconds of the end of one candle into the other, I probably could have taken a little bit more out of it. But um, the initial full process of a two to one trade and I ran it into uh, one of the BWAPs. Okay. Uh, this one has a lot of a lot of things going on in it, which turned out to be um, quite quite a decent quite a decent winner. So we can see if we have a look at the four hour chart. So in my head, uh, this here could be a head and shoulders. It also matches up. You can see my counts with Elliott wave. So I'm looking at a potential um, uh, corrective or maybe even a reversal. So in my head, head and shoulders, at least from a corrective, I'm looking for a three wave, three wave move, which is where these fib levels have come in. That's why I've got these on the charts. So moving on to the 15 minute chart, we can see the price with quite a bearish candle has, has broken through the previous lows. So the bearish structure is still in play. Uh, but I've, I've spoken about earlier how I, I have a look at other trading strategies and, and try and take into account what other traders may be looking at. This purple box here represents a fair value gap on the 15 minute chart. Yeah. This purple box it rep represents a fair value gap from the five minute chart. So you can, so it's not, it's not a one minute fair value gap. Knowing that these two liquidity voids potentially exist for ICT or smart money concept traders, converging with the fact that if this, this is a counter trend trade, this is a corrective trade. I've seen corrective trades hit the 618 of the Fibonacci levels more often than the one-to-ones. Mixed with this is a head and shoulders in my thought process. Mixed with a tiny head and shoulders down here. Mm -hmm. This breakout candle here 
is the reason for my entry. And then you can see my thought processes as I follow price up throughout the trade. So the initial impulsive to the upside ran into a VWAP. I've taken the fib and wanted to see what the pullback would be, recognizing it's the, the, the three level mixed with the neckline of the head and shoulders is why I stayed in this trade. I've added the triangle in there because I'm looking for a potential breakout on it. Again, we've got the breakout and that's why I've, I've run it into the level that I ran it into. Um, so throughout the trade, so the, the, the thought process going into the pre-trade and the thoughts throughout the trade, when I have a look at that chart, I, I can see what, what had been going on. Let's, that's good. That's good. Let's just, let's talk about, you know, because a lot of traders might get into it or they do get into these positions where they've gotten into a trade and then they tend to overthink or to convince themselves of reasons why they shouldn't be in it, okay? And or they try and get themselves out of it as quickly as possible because uh, because of their nerves, uh, fear of some sort. They want to hold on to their profits, etc. What do you do to make you or to keep you in the trade so you can let those runners run? Or your winners run, I should say. I try and look at the trade from both sides. So again, we, we're in a game of probabilities. So I'm having a look at, so from, from a bullish aspect, what I, I, throughout the trade I have a look at what, what would be a bearish argument for price to turn here. So these Fibonacci levels here represent this down move. Yep. So I'm looking at these potentially as areas where there could be a reaction, a reaction to the downside. Of. Because, also, because also, on, honestly, I mean, most most traders would either want to get out here at the the, the MA or this uh, VWAP, right? They'd be looking at the, that as their target. But you you took it even further. Would, what made you believe yeah. or think to yourself that you know you were going to get more out of it? Uh, two things: the volatility of these initial candles in the up move. Mm -hmm. Tell me that there's 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 buyers are well in control, and this head and shoulders I think is quite obvious. Yeah. So if these things are quite obvious to a lot of people, it gives me more confidence that this will run further than into the the 200 MA. I recognise that there are 200 MA traders here that will be looking to short, but I also recognise that this candle here is a break of the neckline. So anyone who any of the breakout traders for the head and shoulders, they're coming in heavily here too. So it's it's more about weighing up what the what the larger consensus or the larger or the, the consensus of the herd is really thinking, and that when yeah. that would be the larger time frame takes precedence over the smaller time frame. Would you do you think so that way? One hundred percent. The next trade will show that. But the other stuff that goes through my head is you have a look four hour here. Like this is this has been front run of the 200. It hasn't touched the 200 for a long time on the 400. Mm -hmm. so that is painting an ad deep in my head that people can see. It's a 618 of this move as well. There's a big handle. There's a four hour 200 MA. The bigger players are looking at this level. Mm -hmm. You know I mean so as much as I'm concentrating on what the small guys are doing, the bigger the wider time frame players are looking at this too. And if they're trading the way that I'm trading, when you're trying to front run the old, the most obvious stuff, make sure you get filled in because these are future contracts. These this isn't CFDs. Um, that also sort of gives you a bit of confidence that maybe there's going to be a heavier reaction than just say uh, five or six points. Yeah. Okay. Watching the trade and seeing things like this develop because I I had my stop under here. I because I moved my stop in because this is the neckline. Had this broken down, I'm out. So the thought process was, I mean, I'm, I'm in profit anyway. It broke to the upside, which gave me confidence that this is going to run at least a little bit further and it's going to break through this VWAP, which eventually it did. And then due to uh, the 618 level of, of, the, of the down move, the 618 level of the head and shoulders up move, et cetera, et cetera, these were all good reasons for me to get out because there was a, a number of conf, conf, um, converging factors that are saying bearish to me. Yeah, I mean, and, and I try and look at it from the other side. I go, would I want to short here? And the, the answer is, yeah, probably. I mean, and if I'd say, yeah, I probably want to short here, then that's that's my cue to get out. How do you deal with um, the amount of time it takes for the winner to actually get produced? I mean, because you'll be sitting in this from seven. You've analyzed it. This is pretty much an entire session trade. So you've been sitting here from about nine, seven o'clock at night, which is Australian Eastern time, an hour and a bit, and possibly 
an hour, you could go up to an hour and a half. Um, you know, what type of thoughts or what little devils start sitting on your shoulders that you need to ignore to try and get the potential, the larger win? And what are the what does that conversation sound like to you? So, I know with my own psychology that if I sit here and watch every single um, candle, like with most people, I can talk myself out of my strength. So, like, over time, particularly a trade like this, with this initial movement, I've got a fair bit of confidence with the trade. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll watch the trade, um, and again with what I was explaining before, with these this sort of level here, I've seen a seen a reaction. I'll watch the trade to a level. If I've got a reaction off the level that I'm happy to bring my stop up to. Um, then it's easier for me to walk away from the computer. And what I do is I set alarms on my trading view, because I've got a trading view on my phone. So I'll go in and, and talk to my partner. Um, I'll go make dinner, or I'll, I'll, I'll actively do something that'll take me away from my office, and I'll wait for an alarm to go off. Because right. I know if I sit here and stare at it, um, yeah. sometimes I'll, I'll, I will talk myself out of it. So with this, I, I would have had, a, I had an alarm down here, yep. near my spot, because I, I want to know when I get stopped out because I come and screenshot the, the trade itself. And I had a, an alarm above the previous high. So when I broke the, pre the, the previous high, when I knew I'm, I'm getting confirmation continuing in my direction, that's when I came back to the computer. I had a look at what price action had done. Yeah. Uh, and depending on this, like this was a bit of a dribble. If this was more powerful, then maybe I would have considered pulling my, my target a little bit higher. But Overall, with this trade, I was pretty happy with where the target was and obviously with the way it played out. Yeah. Right. So I agree with you that when we, when you're sitting there staring at the trade, especially when you're in the trade, uh, it is, it's, you'll convince yourself of getting out of it somehow. It doesn't matter what it is. So that's, it's very, I think it's a great idea and it's very important. I do the same thing where we set uh, alerts. The second thing is, is what I think is a, was, is beneficial is let's say that you are you're in here can you see my cursor yep so yep. You, you're in here and once you're in you've got to already have a plan of what you're going to do so if it goes up to here you reduce the stop if it gets up to, and there's, there's my target I'm going to do X, Y, Z things and I'm going to set the alerts at the, the key levels in which I must take that action right? and then walk away right because we can always just turn around and convince ourselves not to be in the trade yeah yeah 100 percent. so once you're in the trade the the biggest the arguments you have in your head i mean you, you need to quiet them down and i, I find that by walking away with alerts i mean I, it calms my head down a little bit i don't convince myself to get out of the trade and just stick to the plan correct all right What's your biggest psychological or behavioural hurdle that you've come up, come across and then gotten over and can you describe that to us? Because I'm sure you're not the only one that has psych psychological or behavioural issues we all have. 100%. So I think a lot of my issues come from confidence. So it's funny that the longer you're in this game and the more experienced um, that you have in this game, the more you realize that you can be wiped out and your positions can be taken away from you very, very quickly. So I suppose it's confidence and a little a little bit of fear. So challenges that I've faced in the past is I'll go through periods of time um, where I'll, I'll, I'll go into a, a longer than normal drawdown or I'll take really high percentage trades usually that work within my system and, and they turn around and smash me to bits. And it's when those periods of times happens where I start to lose confidence in what I'm doing and the doubts start creeping in. So we just spoke about say, throughout this trade that's on the screen. Uh, how did you, why didn't you take out what allowed you to continue? This is an example of a confidence because of my analysis that I, I was going to get a positive outcome and I was comfortable with the way the trade was playing out. But when my confidence is low, Though that narrative that you asked me, of, why haven't you take? Why did you not think about taking out before the 200 MA? Low confidence versions of myself, I would. I'd either this is where I'd, I'd start cutting runners short, and then because I would have seen this continue on to my original TP, that would have compounded 
um, my confidence. It was like, oh, well, you, you've, you've taken the easy way out. This was your initial analysis. And that, that sort of psychology then moves on to the next trade. And if something similar happens, it sort of compounds it. And over a, a longer period of time, that's when you can start really doubting your system or, or doubting your ability to make money um, out of this market. Mm. The way that I've, I've, I've tried to pull myself out of it is, one, you go back and have a look at your results. You know what I mean, so we've had a conversation in the past where my equity curve is positive. So you go and have a look at my equity curve and that sort of gives you reinforcement that the things that you've done in the past or the system that you've utilized has been profitable up until this point. So it gives you confidence to believe that it's going to continue to be profitable and that this is just a down time and it's not going to last forever. Um, the other ways is obviously try and look after yourself better. I mean, I've, I've recognized that because of the hours that I keep with this job where I'm up really, really late, I have an issue with sleeping in. So if I'm going to bed at four, I'm still getting up at 8.30, 9 o'clock. And if you do that three or four times in a row, coming into a Thursday session or a Friday session, not only is my confidence low, but mentally I'm, I'm not switched on. And again, these, right. these are factors that can, that can compound your confidence issue um, if you're not getting enough rest or you're not looking after yourself uh, physically as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, can you show us, uh, you showed me the other day your equity curve that's on uh, Edgewalk, is it? Yep. yep. Can you pull that up for us so everybody can see, you know, what that period, that, that sideways period of time actually looks like. Yeah, so that's the one that I'm looking at there. This one. Exactly. I can pull. So you went. You kind of went sideways between trade number five, two hundred fifty-two to about three hundred and six, something along those lines. How did how did you deal with sitting sideways for yep. so long? And then what what period of time was that? Uh, that's that's been over the last couple of months. Oh, so sideways um, and for and how I dealt. Yeah, sideways for two months. So I'm not I'm, I, I'm not sure if I can give advice on it. I've come out the back end of it. A lot of that sideways movement, there's a lot of me cutting trades short, which is not allowing my equity graph to grow, which would stem from my fear and my low confidence. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I spoke to people. I went, I went, I went and tried to implement methods to clear my mind because I recognized that confidence was the main contributor behind my fear and, be, and behind this movement. And the longer that it went on, the lower my confidence got. And I realized that after a period of time that sitting in front of the charts and doing the same thing over and over in terms of um, getting knocked out of break even, taking losses, cutting runners short, this sort of stuff is only going to exacerbate it. So I, I looked outside of trading itself and not just tried to sit there and, and battle it and, and, and find solutions to to allow myself to be able to physically come in and allow me to sit down at the computer each day more confident. And when I finally managed to do that and I sat down confident, it's been the last couple of weeks, all of a sudden I've put together some runners um, and some bigger trades that have reconfirmed in my mind and lessened the stress in my mind that say, no, hang on, you, you do have a clue of what you're doing and that this strategy still works. Um, you, just, you just need to be better mentally prepared to handle it each night. So yeah. the, 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 I've got new aspects of my trading routine that I, I'm trying to implement to make sure that every time I sit down, I'm in a better headspace so that if these sideways areas were to occur again, hopefully they don't last for as long. Does that, include, does that include positive self-talk before you start a session? Yeah. So, well, again, looking at this equity graph and having a look, because with Edge Wonk, I can go through and filter my winner trades, obviously. And I, I sometimes I sit there and just have a look at my previous winners. And that in itself is not necessarily me talking to myself, but it's showing myself that this is what you've done in the past. There's no reason why you can't do it again or continue to do it. And that it, when you're patient or if you're not forcing trades or if you get the initial reaction that you're looking for, you need to have the stones sometimes just to hold it. Just hold it. Let it, let it run. Because... Yeah. If I go back through my journal and have a look at my 5R, 6R, 8R trades, they're the ones that make you money. You know, right. you've got your bread and butter 2R trades, but it's when you start cutting those bigger ones short is when the equity graph starts tapering off and 
is what me the individually. The, the, conundrum, really the conundrum comes down to how do you know which one's going to be the big one? And the answer to it is you don't. Exactly. Yeah. You never I mean, you so never the, know the last one's couple one's of been. weeks, the volatility has given me a fairly good indication that if I was to let this run, that they could potentially run because of the volatility of the market. You know what I mean? And so I've been frustrated paid. with some of my trades that I hadn't let them run. So there's been a couple in the last two weeks where the initial move was quite volatile. And, and because of the market conditions, letting it run reaped quite big rewards. Yeah. Okay. So it's very important to keep things running. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So... Uh, you're looking. You've you've got yourself onto some funding, which is great. And you're looking for um, looking for the next uh, level. Um, yep. You you're you're confident with sticking with what you're doing, or is there anything else that you're looking at, or or what's the future kind of looking like? It's just to keep improving what I'm doing, and in no way, shape, or form do I think I'm the finished product. You know what I mean as the, the amount of trades I, I look at back through my journal, the ones that I'm 100% happy with, I, you count on one hand. You know what I mean, and there's nearly 400 trades there. So that constant striving to say every 100 trades, you, you want that number of trades that, you know, I, I played that exactly how I wanted to play. You want that to, to continue to improve. And the trades that you don't play well or the trades that you cut short or you don't move your stop when you should because you... You, your bias is too heavy in one direction, uh, which still happens. It happened to me the other night. I took a full loss when I should have taken a reduced loss or even a break even because of my bias. Um, eliminating those aspects of my trading is an ongoing process and will continue to be an ongoing process. But I think that the, the longer I do this and the more experience I get, that's the only way to really truly build good habits. You can't learn them quickly and this game takes time. Do you think you'll ever get rid of all of your mistakes? No. I don't think there's one trader on the planet that's uh, faultless in their trading. Correct. And um, but you've got to you've got to add that into the contingency, I guess, don't you? Yeah, one hundred percent. So how do you mitigate your mistakes? I mean, recognizing being able to recognize a mistake earlier is a way to mitigate it because then you're not copying as big a uh, red P and L off the back of that one trade. Yeah. You mean and having a look at why you got in. Uh, self-evaluating your emotional state when you got in, all that sort of stuff to eliminate the amount of times it happens. It's just constantly refining. I, I, I believe my system is profitable. Um, it's just down to me as an individual improving my, my own performance to implement this strategy better, continuously improving it. Um, and hopefully then the equity curve uh, will start pointing up quicker. Yeah. Okay. And what... Just before we, we wrap it up, is there any advice that you would give somebody who's listening to this or watching us do this? What's your advice to them if they're really keen about wanting to trade and all those sorts of things? What's your maybe a couple of takeaways that you could give advice on? Be prepared to put in the work. It's not, it's not a, a, a short road to success. Um, it's, it takes time. Some people, it may take two years, some people may take five years, some people may take 10 years, but you need to recognize that when you get involved with this, that you'll never learn everything. You'll constantly be taking in new information and the path to success isn't straight. And it's, you, you're you going to be tested in every aspect of your psyche in, in, in performing. You're going to have good times, um, but sometimes the hardest money you will ever make in any job will be through trading. Sometimes it's easy money, but it's, it's you, you. You just need to keep working at it. You can't quit. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. You know, some a lot of guys will come into this initially, seeing that it's easy, but unfortunately, it's not. Right. Um, difference between speculating and gambling, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, that's it. It's easy to gamble. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's very very hard to trade. Yeah. All right, well, we'll wrap it up there. All right, thank you very much for spending the time with us and uh, hopefully the listeners and the viewers have got something out of it. And uh, if there's any way they, they can contact you, probably be through our Discord. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Easiest way is send me a DM in the, in the Discord. 
in our Discord, and I'll put the Discord link up in the uh, comments below. So keep your eye out for that or any other links that we've got in there so that you can uh, benefit from what we've got to offer, I guess. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Awesome. No worries. All right. Thanks, guys.